Welcome to the What You're Craving podcast. Molly here with one of my favorite people. I do say that a lot and I mean it a lot and I mean it a lot in this moment right now with Brad Reedy, Dr. Dr. Brad Reedy. I call him Brad. And uh, this is some resume here, my friend. I'm going to do it short because we have a lot to talk about. I'll give you highlights. Dr. Brad Reedy is co-owner and clinical director of Evoke Therapy Programs, which are experientially based therapy programs for adolescents, young adults, families. He's the founder of Enlightening Relationships and provides parent coaching, couples therapy, and individual therapy. He also has worked as a therapist for like so many years, like me, we're long-term mm. healers, you and me, huh? Mm -hmm. And... Um, Notably, he created and ran the most successful wilderness program in the country called Second Nature. And uh, Brad's a well-known speaker and a parent educator, author of two awesome books, Journey of the Heroic Parent and Audacity to Be You. I love both of them. And he's also a fellow podcaster with his podcast, Evoke, that has over 1.1 million downloads. It's so exciting. Um, I also like to say not included in this resume, but probably will happen for many of us today. Uh, Brad can make you cry authentically at the drop of a hat. So just like be prepared. Okay. I'm my tissues on the other side of the room. So I'm just going to use my sleeve if I need to. Mm. And welcome, my dear friend. I'm so glad to be with you. Always. Great to talk to you in any any context. I same Z's. Um, you know, two want two wounded healers walk into a bar and have a conversation. Let's do it. Right. So what you crave, what you're craving is all about the real stuff, right? Like you and I've I've been an addictions and eating disorder therapist forever. You too. And uh it's never really about the thing, is it? It's mm -hmm. never really about the food. It's never really about the drug. It's never really about the relationship. It's about something else. And I just spent so many years talking about the thing and wanting to talk about the thing under the thing. Right. And here we are. So what do you think? What do you think? What do you think we're really craving? You Let's know, get I right think, to it. <laughs> you brought up, as you always do, several points. I think being up against the defense in our practices in our lives is exhausting. Mm -hmm. You know, when you're talking about the, the the thing that's presenting itself to you, you're, you're really up against the defense. And um, it's a it's a it's an incredible process that all of these symptoms that you just described are so effective at distracting us from what's really going what's really going on, what's authentic. And so I, I think we're craving authentic connection. I think people come to therapy to solve the problem, whatever the problem is. And if they stay in therapy long enough, it becomes something entirely different. Yes. Um, and I, I, when you were talking, uh, as you were introducing things, I was thinking about my favorite moment in a session is when a client says to me, I know I'm not supposed to say this, or I know this is the wrong thing to say. And I just sit up and I think we're about to hear the truth. We're about to hear what, what's real and most authentic about them today right now and so i think we're we're seeking we're like three the, minutes into the session and i've already um started <laughs> tearing up so I, we're, we're seeking for that authentic connection and we're mm -hmm. we've also been taught out of it and we're terrified of it because of the experiences we've had in the past with it fun fact about you and me in the spirit of wounded healers is we come to this pretty naturally right i'm you know have a really long road of recovery from addictions and from eating disorders. And I do my work still. Mm -hmm. And your books talk about this. I'm not like outing your process, but right. what's that like for you? Like, what's it like for you to have, or have had that parallel process of having break opens and doing the therapy and talking about it? Like, what's that, what's that work been like for you? You know, <laughs> It's the only thing I know. Uh, you know, I, I I think that at some level, it's what brings most every therapist who does a good job at what they do, brings them to the work. I think it's just those who haven't recognized it. So for me, um, I'm just trying to give to other people what somebody else gave to me. Mm 
-hmm. in my process. Mm -hmm. And for me, you know, the, the, the most important thing I have to offer, I have some training, of course, I have some education. I have a unique perspective at, at watching and learning from clients, but my own work is really um, the, the thing that I have to offer. Having traversed the landscape myself of my horrible rotten self, I then can sit with somebody else patiently, like I've been sat with, um, and, and love them the way that I've been loved. So for me, it's all the same. And it's, it's, it's really, I think that the thing, I want to say the only thing, but at least the most, the most, uh, the only thing I have of value to add people is my own experience of having gone through my work, my, my healing, my hey, challenges. Say more about this, um, horrible self. I, I think, cause I want people to really, I, I encounter a lot of people in, you know, in, in therapy and in groups that are really deep, deep, deep in self-loathing. And I mean, certainly when we're talking about addictions and eating disorders, I think it's very much at the root is numbing quickly because you sure. cannot, and I know it's my experience, cannot sit, just cannot sit with yourself. Right. So when you're saying like, I got to know my horrible self, what is that? Can you sort of dumb that down for the back row over here? Molly Carmel in the back row needs it real dumbed down. <laughs> well, you know, it, it, it's not really a horrible rotten self. It's what I believe to be my horrible rotten self. You know, I, I like everybody else and spending so much time and energy my entire life trying to be good, um, mm -hmm. trying to be worthy. Um, and I'm afraid to show my authentic self, which has talents and beauty and skills and gifts and also has weaknesses and mistakes and messiness and fears and darkness. And so when I, when I talk about the, the subtitle of the second book, learning to love your horrible rotten self, I'm saying getting in touch with who you are. One of my ideas is if you can accept that you're the devil, you're free. Tell me you more. Can Tell me more. <laughs> if you can accept that you're that you're the embodiment of evil then you're just free to love meaning and i don't mean accept it in the judgmental way that we we fear i'm talking about i'm the horrible rotten self is brad it's molly it's it's just me and so for me it's a liberating experience when one when i have that moment where i see myself all of my warts all of the darkness and i'm i i sit with it i see it i know it i'm patient with it and can then you I'm put free it into like tangible. Can you give us like a life example of something you couldn't look at? And then, then, then you knew the devil and then you're okay now. Yeah. We're, we're really in the chair, huh, Brad? <laughs> I mean, it's, 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 it's really just every day. Um, it's, you know, the, the, a couple of my values are, are of course, being a good husband, mm -hmm. being a good father, being a good therapist. Um, I'll share one from therapy. It's when I have made a mistake in therapy. Mm -hmm. As a therapist I, or as a patient? As a therapist. Oh, okay. That's good. When I've made a mistake as a therapist, mm -hmm. I've misinterpreted, uh, I've gone in a direction that doesn't feel right or good to the client and the client gets upset. Earlier in my career, I would defend my position because I need to be good. Mm -hmm. Or as a husband or father, I would defend my intent how would position. you do it? Like, what would you say? Like, say it with your wife. I it, didn't it, mean to. That wasn't what I meant to say. Oh, okay. I didn't want to hurt your feelings. I was coming from a good place. If you knew what I was thinking and feeling, you wouldn't be upset with me. Hmm. When one accepts their own humanness, then they can be present to love somebody else. And so when the client says, Brad, that didn't feel good, I can simply say, I'm so sorry. I'm yeah. so glad that you told me. Um, I can say that with my wife or my children. I was thinking about this this morning. We have a letter that parents write to their children in our program when they first get there that's evolved over the years. And I was thinking of the irony of it that, that often my very first assignment to a parent who comes to me for parent coaching is to find something to apologize to their child for. And that comes from a position of strength. So the simplest way, it, it just comes out, it came out last night with my daughter just saying, I'm sorry. I'm sorry I snapped. I'm sorry I reacted because I've made peace with the fact that I'm human in those moments, I should say, because mm -hmm. it's not always I can say I'm sorry if I'm not OK with who I am, my horrible, rotten self. 
I will try to be the good dad. And being the good dad, being the good husband, being the good therapist is completely at odds with connecting to people, with listening, with understanding where they're coming from. Sounds like it's almost defending yourself too. It's saying, well, I didn't right. mean it. And here's what I, instead of saying, wow. Right. I, that, right. That's not, that, yeah. I Wow, I really struggle with that. So I have a lot to learn. That's, that's it's good. A, it's a great thing to practically lean into. There's a, the, the epigraph of my book, borrowed from another author, author, of course, says that why were each of us taught the notion of being correct when these very notions ensured our failure in the world? Hmm. Um, so being, you know the, being happy instead of right, is that? Uh, um, it's just being you hmm. instead of that. That's if there was a thesis to the second book and there's not one thesis, it would be you don't get to be right or good anymore but you do get to be a self and that is so much better. Mm, I want to talk about that length, that, and really break it down again, dumbing it down from my, my personal back row. I think about all the time I've spent in as a therapist in therapy with people talking about binging and talking, you know, about episodes of shame, episodes of guilt, mm -hmm. episodes of self-harm. And I, I've, I've, two questions about it. My first question is when I really get to the root of it, so often it's saying yes, when you mean no, saying no, when you mean yes, not setting a limit, you know, not being true, not being true. When you think about that as an idea, like what do you think some of the solutions are? And what do you think some of the problems people have with you know, being it being different in relationship or saying what you need in relationship. Two thoughts come to mind. Um, first, one of my issues with self help influencers, self help books, which I've written. So, so <laughs> uh, you've written, we've written them, <laughs> is that they they kind of tell you what to do, and therapy it'll offer ideas, suggestions, and tools, but it really helps you work through your resistance. I had a client not too long ago said she was talking about a boundary with her family and, and she got very clear about what it meant to tell the truth to her mother, to her sister and to her husband about what she was feeling and what she needed. She was crystal clear about that and said it, said it to me. And I said, that sounds wonderful, amazing, because it was honest. And she said, but why can't I? And the answer that we explored together is because you would have to face the most frightening thing in the world, which is that you're a bad sister, a bad daughter, and a bad wife. You have to do battle with the dragon of shame and guilt. Mm -hmm. You have to, I'm not okay. saying that you slay it all the time, but you have to fight with it because what you're really facing is what you have been taught is the right way or the good way to be. And that's what therapists do. We don't, we treat resistance. We treat that, that shame and that, that, that fear of that, that shadow side, that dark side of us. Let's pause on this thing. The right, I think that part of what makes us need to numb is that, which is the right thing to be. Right. I mean, I, mean, I can speak from my own experience. I think you can speak for your own experience too, because I read it in your personal story about how you had to heal the relationship with your wife was actually, sounds like exactly this, which is to say, I need to be able to say what I need a little bit differently. Right. I need to be able to have a little bit more space in this. I need you to understand me differently. I need to understand you differently, which I would love to hear about how that work felt. Cause I know for me, it's been oof, slaying the dragon to say the least, but how do people actually do that? Right? Like, how do we eat? How do we get there? I only know one way. Cause it's the only way that I've learned how to do it is you have to sit with somebody who can, I'm going to use words that might load a little differently to you or to the audience. So, so you well, we'll unload them if we need to, you know, um, I have to sit with somebody who can tolerate me. Mm. And if I can sit with you, if you're my therapist and I get to be me and that's okay, which means you as my therapist, Molly, you need to manage your anxiety, your fear, your frustration, your anger, that needs to be sorted out somewhere else. If I get to be me here, I start to take that out there into the world and I say, it's okay to be me because I have this experience with, I, I've re-experienced myself as okay. I, I, I shared this in the book and, and it's, 
it's the most vivid kind of humorous example that, that I have. It's when my therapist said to me in around 2010, she said, when I was stuttering to self-disclose some stupid thing I had done recently, and she said, Brad, I need to I need to say something to you that if you were coming in here telling me you were having sex with a chicken, I would assume you had a good reason and I would just want to understand what it is. And this I realized- This is my favorite story about, I mean, I have told this story to clinicians that I supervised so many times because in that moment- You have to moment, experience that. Yeah, you have that to experience moment. that room. For sure. I, so, does it have to be with a therapist? I love therapy. I love therapists. Does it have to be with a therapist? Could it be with a friend? Could it be with someone in your power circle? Could it be with clergy? Could it be with somebody? It sounds like it has to be with somebody who has done their own work. It has to be with somebody who's comfortable with their own stuff. Right. Yeah, it can happen in, for example, support groups where you oh. don't pay money and yeah, there are others there struggling with similar issues, right? It can happen mm -hmm. with clergy. It can happen with, with trusted friends if you are lucky enough to have that. It can happen with a parent, more or less, if you're lucky enough to have that kind of a parent. What I love about therapy is the deal is I pay you for your time, end of deal. Mm -hmm. It's transactional. I paid it. I paid you for the time. And now this is for me. Mm -hmm. I, I don't have to do anything else for you. I don't have to improve, get better, not be who I am. And so it's a unique place, but I, I theoretically, yes. Have I found it a lot in my life? Have I found um, lots of people with that kind of capacity? No, but, but I do think we we've got to find our tribe. Absolutely. Power you know? circle, power circle, power yes. circle. Yeah. Got to find our people. That's part of our, our job, I think. And so, you know, I'll, I might cry. I mean, you're one of my people. You're one of my people. I can be, and I've come to you, you've come to me and I've come to you when we had lots of questions about our lives. And so, and you don't, and, and you did, you know, I remember that day, it was a Thursday when I called you, you just reflected back love and compassion. And, and then the best part of me came out because of that. So it's such a good reminder because you say in the book and you say, I mean, I've been lucky enough. You're my friend and you're also my teacher. I've, I think good therapists have therapy for their therapy, which I've had you in years of my life and it's been life-changing. Um, and a lot of your notes to me is, you know, it's a more loving thing to do sometimes to sit with people in their pain rather than jumping to solve their problems, yeah. which is probably a line from your book too. And it's so hard and it's so hard. And yet like my, one of my best friends, Lauren always tries to solve my problems. And I sometimes have to say to her, I'm going to hang up this phone right now. Mm. I swear if you try to solve my problem, she's learned a lot in her time with, right. friends with me, but what do you think that's about? Like, what do you, why do you think we're always trying to fix everything? I don't, I, I call it an, an intolerance for our empathic misery. Whoa. That's a lot of 25 cent words. Can you, you help know, with that? Those of us, us wounded healers come to this work often with a, a great capacity towards empathy we feel we, we 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 carry heavily the pain and the distress of the people around us and so we fix them so that we can feel better mm, say that we fix we try to fix people's problems so, so we that can we can feel better right and i think even for therapists i think a lot of people not a lot of people but i think many people understand the idea that you don't want to fix people but I, I don't think therapists know that very much. I think therapists believe that the the kind of standard ask from the client, which is I have a symptom or a problem, can you fix it? I think they enroll themselves in that job. And what, what I talk about is my shift is from fixing you to understanding you. And in understanding you, you heal yourself in the process. Mm -hmm. You re-experience yourself in a different way. And so mm -hmm. I, I think the work of therapy and, and this is the this is an invisible concept is to sit in the discomfort and pain to sit with somebody in their unsolvable problem is one of the greatest gifts 
of, of presence that we can offer to a fellow human being. Mm. Absolutely. Yeah. Full presence is the greatest gift that we give. And it's not easy. I mean, I, yes, I think therapists do it. I think parents do it. I think partners do it. And I think this idea that we're solving the problem because we're uncomfortable is really profound. I can say in my life, uh, I, w- I was in a, a tumultuous place personally and professionally, and I was lucky enough to be do- working, doing work, working with you. And I, I remember because this was really profound for me because I am such a fixer to fix my own feelings. I, you know, it's just like I was raised in my own family of origin, mm-hmm. you know, get over it, get over it, get over it. You know, mm-hmm. I, was, I was raised in a problem solving family, which caused me a lot of eating <laughs> and drinking, but mm-hmm. another story for another time. And I remember sitting there and I was telling you how hard, how hard it was because I had to go and tell these deep truths to people that I've been holding lies. And I had to go tell people I worked with. It was like a big thing. And this is what you said to me. You And I'm so New York about things, you know? And you said, Molly, you're wonderful. And I was like, okay, yep. What's the rest of the sentence? Yeah, I know. Okay, what else? You know, I was like, I was waiting for your butt, you know? But, you know, you've not told these people the truth, whatever it was going to be. And I said, yeah, what else, Brad? And you said, that's it. You're wonderful. Mm. And it was like, and you said, you know, Molly, you can always guarantee to these people that you're going to do your work. And that is the gift you're going to give them when you go and have to tell them these things. Right. Right. Oh, you know, who does this, you, you, you know, speaking of, of translating this, this, these ideas practically, you know, who I think the best, most, the simplest, most, um, uh, practical model for this is Mr. Rogers. Oh, I'm so glad he's coming to our podcast today. Welcome, I mean, Fred. Watch his, watch the movie by Tom Hanks, but watch the documentary that came out at about the same time. Yeah. And you'll know what, I didn't know what he was doing when I was a kid. I thought he was strange or weird. I thought he was talking down to us. Yeah. Now I know what he was doing. I, I couldn't recognize it probably because of my own, my own, my own upbringing, my own trauma uh, experience with my own family of origin. But now I know what he was doing. He's, he's holding people in, in ways that, most people don't get held. Yeah, I cried my eye. Those one of them. It it gives you hope, and I think yeah. that that's a big piece of where we are right now, currently, current day. Is I, say it. What do you want to say about that? It's a painful time right now. Um, I understand. I understand why people are re- reacting to each other to to the pandemic to the divide in our country. I I know people on either ends of the continuum are hurting and and in pain. And, um, you know, I I don't know how this gets accomplished on on a large societal scale, but, but I know the answer is compassion. Yeah. I mean, I I know the answer is, is love. And that's not to say that there's no accountability or there are no boundaries or rules or consequences, but from an emotional standpoint, um, I think we've tried shame and guilt and punishment and fear long enough as individuals and as a society realize that doesn't work. And the story I love, for example, in Les Mis, when the bishop gives the silver candlesticks to Jean Valjean and Jean Valjean transforms in a moment to then become this person who gives for the rest of his life. I mean, that's just a story. It's just a Victor Hugo story, but it is, it speaks to this idea that, that, that deep, lasting, profound healing and change only happens in grace. Whoa. Whoa. But so, isn't grace kind of a finite thing that drops in? Like you get granted it? Or what do you think about that? <laughs> For most of us, it's pretty finite. Yeah. 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 I mean, I just, this is what I think. Cause sometimes when I'm with people and I see the opening with them and they're like ready to do something really hard, like give up drugs or give up sugar or something. And I'm like, and I'll say it in the room. I'll say, hold on, (laughs) this thing's 24 hours long. You know, like you have this openness, you have this moment of willingness. In fact, I was in a group yesterday and one of my clients says, well, how, like, what is the characteristic of people that are successful? And I said, willingness, (laughs) grace, that's it. Mm -hmm. You know, just this moment that you're willing to believe something a little bit different than, you know, what your fear and what your shame and what this chronic demoralization is telling you, you know, and, uh, but I think it's, I think this piece is not, 
easy. And I want to make sure that for people that are listening, we, we get to this part of how to do it or boil it into a place that they can hold it with us. Right. right. Because right. it is such a troubling time. I think what, what, what we're seeing is this lack of self sometimes, or this not wanting to be with yourself. Right. And it's almost like measuring, ideally, measuring a healthy relationship with others is almost easier than measuring a relationship with yourself. I, I think there's so many of us that never even had an opportunity to develop self. Right, right. So that there's an emptiness inside and the I society think, um, makes it very easy to fill. <laughs> you know, in parenting, um, and I think about this in, in, in a lot of different contexts, but um, I think one of the um, the dominant messages of our culture is that the job of a parent is to raise a good child, a good athlete, a good student, a good citizen, you know, pick your, your cat, a good dancer, a good poet, a good engineer, whatever it is. Um, but what we learn through the lens of psychology is the job of a parent is to raise a healthy self, which is, like I said earlier, talented, resourceful, stupid, sometimes mm -hmm. silly, sometimes ineffective, sometimes makes a human, they're mm -hmm. human and humans are, are messy and imperfect. Um, but there's so much in our culture that suggests to us that it's a Western idea. There's so yeah. much in our culture that the idea is to be good when psychology teaches us and, and Eastern philosophies teach us, it's really about being whole. It's about being all of you. And awake. And awake about it. Right. And awake. Absolutely. Yeah. I love that. You know, like Tara Brach says, you know, which just goes back to what we were saying before, like the greatest gift we give others is our full presence. Right. And I think even in relationships for me, sometimes I'm not all there. I'm either thinking about something or I'm on my phone or I'm not you know, right. really able to, or I'm not. And I think even what we're saying right now, I'm maybe even not comfortable with what we're talking about, or right. I really want to fix it. Like if a friend is really struggling with something, I, I am having a hard time sitting with it. And I want to just do something about it, mm -hmm. especially current time with so much going on. And so how do we know, how do we work on that? I think in my, like in my, cause I'm more behaviorally trained than you are. We, we talk about toleration. We talk about tolerating distress, getting more comfortable exposure to that. But I think we want to go even deeper than, than that today. You know, one of, one of the, the tasks of parenting is co-regulation, mm -hmm. right? Modeling back to the child, a sense of safety, simple examples of a child falls and, and, and bumps their knee. They look to the parent to see if they are okay. Right. And if the parent is okay, the child is okay. Right. They, they, they internalize kind of the, the parent's nervous system response. Mm -hmm. Right. And so, um, again, uh, you know, going back to it is, is finding somebody that can model that for you. If I come to you with a problem, with an issue, with a confession and your response is, I hope this comes across on the audio and, and, and your response is to gasp like, <gasps> Right. I immediately know you're not a safe person. Yeah. I immediately know I have to take care of you. So I have to find somebody else who can sit with me and, and be okay with me. And so it's, it's, it's co-regulation. Um, like I said, I, I do it through therapy. There's one point I wanted to make Molly, cause I think sometimes when I talk about these ideals, the, the, the Buddhist teacher Thich Nhat Hanh explains that we try to be there for our other person as much as we can. He calls it a dear one posture. So we say to our loved one, we say, dear one, I'm here for you. Mm -hmm. But if we are triggered, he doesn't use that word, but if we, if something happens where we're unavailable to be with them in a compassionate place, we say to them, of course, this is just a dialogue that's kind of metaphorical. We say, dear one, I can't be there for you right now. I need to go to my practice, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. Take a break, a time out, clock out at night so you don't work 12 hours, whatever it is. I need to go take care of myself. Then we do that. And then we come back and we say, now I'm ready again. So I think this idea of being perfect and completely capable is, is a problem with some of the, the, some of what I talk about it. We have to also practice self-care because if I'm 
exhausted, if my bandwidth is, is, is exhausted, I can't be there for you. So I've got to take care of me first, which is coming full circle. Myself has to be developed before I can be there for yourself. I'm obsessed with this. A, people think it's selfish to do that. Right. Uh, like people think it's so selfish to do that. Right. What do we say? So people will say, because this, ha- I mean, to me, this is such a root of food addiction, eating disorders, all of it, right? Because we end up looking for the nourishment and the nurturing that we really are not giving ourselves in the substance. And and right. if you want me to lighten it in the Instagram, in the swiping on the Bumble, like whatever it is. And it's really because there's a lacking that we're not getting it ourselves. And people will say two things, right? Because I have this conversation a lot. I'm sure you do too. They'll say, isn't that really selfish to say no to something? Or they'll say, (laughs) not so nicely to me, you know, it must be really nice for you to have all that time to be able to take care of yourself, Molly, you know, really. And and, uh, to me, it, to me, it's not, it's, it's not a luxury self-care. Right. I mean, people suffer when I don't take care of myself, right. Right. <laughs> like right. big time, like big time. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I think the first person, the first place we learn that it's selfish is from our parents. Yeah. We get told that we are selfish. First of all, uh, the word selfish, I try to kind of debunk. First of all, um, the opposite of selfish would be selfless. And that doesn't make any sense either. Right. Right. To right. not have a self to be selfless is kind of the opposite of what you and I are trying to help people develop is. Well, and frankly, I actually think that people who aren't selfless do turn out to be a little selfless, right? Very. Like, they, they, if they, if you can't take care of yourself, you will steal from other people oof. constantly. I think the other thing, can I just say while we're up, I think people who are trying to do it all are not doing it all well. That's mm. what I've experienced. I have a lot of friends that are just trying, you know, and they're just, and usually the thing they're not doing well is themselves, which, right. which I think is the whole cycle of it. And then they're not able to give and then they're, and then they think, well, I just don't have the time to do it. Right. right. I think it's Teach Not Han, who says that sometimes he takes a vacation when he opens a doorknob. Is that him? It's, it might be someone else. Sounds like something he would say. Yeah. He mindfully opens the doorknob and right, that's right. the time in which he, it's very, right romantic in its own way, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. So what do we, so, cause I really do think so, but I think, so there's two problems with it. A it's self. And I think also people don't can't tolerate themselves. I know for me, when I was first starting out trying to quit all my stuff, the idea of sitting quietly with myself, I would have been like, just put razors in my eyeballs. I cannot sit alone with myself. I know a lot of my clients and a lot of people who I experience right. in my communities would be like, there's nothing I would rather do less than sit alone with myself. Like no dice. Like, so you and I are sort of, you know, we got some time under our belt and being healthy, but I mean, don't you, would you want, like when you first, like when you first hit that bottom years ago, if I would have said to you, Hey, you need some self-care. Why don't you sit alone with yourself today? Well, you're a wilderness guy. So you're probably like, great. I'll make you a fire. No problem. But you know who said it to me? And it worked. And I remember where I was standing, my son, Mm -hmm. he was 17 at the time. And he said, haven't, haven't spent much time alone. Have you? (laughs) And he said it both lovingly, but also pointedly. What do you mean? I knew what I knew what he meant is that I had distracted myself Mm. in all the ways that one can distract oneself with compulsions and addictions and all kinds of things. So that I didn't, I mean, isn't that what substance use or anything that becomes addictive is? It's, it's an attempt to not be present with yourself Absolutely. in your own life. Yeah. I mean, I think there's that chemical piece of all of it yeah. that like yeah. the brain can't stop. But I think underneath that is, is that it's like a low level search for meaning. Of course. I think a lot of people quit there because this is interesting. I think, I think a lot of people quit there because they can't be by, they can't be with themselves and they're sure they're sure it's about you. Like I'm getting tired of myself saying the same thing, having the same complaints. The moment, if somebody's able to press past that mm-hmm. idea, kind of 
kind of, they try to beat you to the punch. So they quit before you're going to get tired of them and fire them. Mm. If they can get past that, I think the work begins when we allow ourselves to take the risk to say, if I come back next week, Molly won't look at me and discuss an exasperation that I haven't figured this out yet. Mm. If I can do that and I get lucky enough, which I would, if it was you, that you would just love me and say, I know it's that's when a, the work begins. It's such a beautiful note for those who are with people who are suffering. I mean, it's such a relaxing note for everybody, which is if you're sitting with someone who's suffering, your job is not to fix it. Yeah. Like take a breath. Your job is to be present with it and just be okay with it so that the person you love can be okay with it too. Yeah. Then you don't need to go binge eat after your friend tells you something hard and you weren't able to fix it. A, a client said that to me this morning. Um, she was getting her nails done and she said, the, the, the person that she knows very well that she's been going to for years said she could tell that, that, that my client was agitated. So the person doing the nails said, just breathe and just relax. And she said to herself, if Brad was here, he wouldn't tell me to just breathe and relax. He would get curious about why I'm upregulated, why I'm agitated. And he would ask me to lean into that. And that's like Mr. Rogers. He wouldn't tell you not to be angry. No. He would ask you about it. And, and that's so counterintuitive to our, our the way, uh, the sensibility with which we were raised. We just, we don't lean into it. We try to fix, solve, placate, make it, you know, make it go down instead of saying, I wonder why you're upregulated. I wonder why you're anxious, why you're angry, why mm -hmm. you're being triggered right now. That's, mm -hmm. that's the fascinating question, the fascinating story. Well, I think that when we talk about a relationship with food and diet culture that comes into it, like the first reaction when you harm yourself with food is to effectively make a deeper cut and put more crap in it, right? Like, right, well, I right. had a cupcake, so like, let's go out and do it. Yep. And I think that when we move from, you know, uh, uh, you know, diet culture into a relationship with food, like what I always say is like, can we approach this with some compassion, self, right. and some curiosity? Like, right. what would that be like to, and people are like astounded. This is like, I'm speaking a new, you know, people that can't, believe it, like, oh, oh, that. And then by the way, you can usually get some insight into yourself and create a sense of self. Right. I have a really important question I, I have to ask you about, because I'm, I'm actually just curious, both for my own practice and for the listener. Mm -hmm. So here's the other thing I think blocks people. I think you're right um, to say that they are worried that they're going to be rejected by the other person. Absolutely. But here's this thing I'm hearing a lot, which is you know, if I really get to know myself, I'm going to figure something out about my life that's going to be so awful that I'm not going to be able to tolerate it. This mm -hmm. is like a in my communities right now, this is like a big on all of like in my Facebook groups, whatever. This is a big note. What do you like? I say something a little irreverent, which I don't, I'm not even sure I want to say, but I want to mm -hmm. hear it. It's not as compassionate as what you're about to say. So what do you what do you think about that? I think it's, I, 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 yes, I, I agree with you. I think I said it the other day to somebody. It's similar, a little bit different, but, but, but I think it's the same thing. Uh, somebody said their, their husband didn't want to come to therapy, was, was averse to therapy. And I, we were talking about it and I said, it sounds like he's afraid that if he finds something out about himself, that's a problem that he'll have to change it. And he doesn't want to be accountable to that information. Like he'll right. find something broken or ugly or, or, or decide he doesn't want to be married to her or something. Right. So I think that's be what, something like that. Right. Yeah. And, and, and you, you know, what, what you're describing is, I don't think it happens that way. I, I, I think that that's our initial thought about it, but as I plumb the depths of my darkness, <laughs> um, I like to think that I've made friends with them. My darkness, they're not running the show anymore because See, when I feel anxious and I don't feel worthy, I start to try to impress you. It looks very grandiose, narcissist-like, which I hate, right? It's like my, 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 the ugliest part of myself and other people. That, that's, what, that's what kind of is my mother, my mother tongue. And so the more I realize that that narcissistic, braggadocious, trying to impress you, telling stories, 
about himself that, that shows his worthiness self when I realized that that's just a scared little kid mm -hmm. whose parents didn't have time or interest in him. Yeah, that's pretty easy to be compassionate towards. And that that presentation that you're describing softens. So I don't fix the narcissistic presentation, I heal the narcissistically wounded child. And so I think you sort of tap in and talk to him. You say, Hey, yeah, buddy, right. Okay. Sit with him. Yeah. You, like, but I like, I you. love this idea. Like this is a, this is an actionable thing, right? So yeah. when you see those parts of you that are, I'm like this big and loud. And, you know, right. I was told Molly, you're too much or too much, right. which I think really benefits me today. The too much, you know, yeah. that's sort of like, Hey, it's okay. It's okay. Yeah. yeah. It's okay. A woman asked me, should I, when I see my scarcity, um, single mother, she was a single mother for many years. She said, when I see that scarcity single mother in me come up, cause she's not right now, she's not living in scarcity. What do I tell her? She doesn't need to be scared anymore. And I said, well, you, you could say that, or you could just say to her, I hear you. And I understand why you were scared. Ooh. And, and, you know, her eyes glistened with tears to fill up and she realized that's a different way of regarding oneself than the way that she had been trained to, to fix herself. Yeah. I guess I also wonder maybe a little bit more simplistically. I mean, I do, I like love me some Buddhism. Let me say, love it, love it. Changed my whole life. I mean, I also do like to think about like right now problems. And so my response also was like, is there a problem? Like, I think a lot of things are, are solvable. Like, if this woman, if it's like, yeah, I'm miserable in my marriage, like, okay, well then that's something that's, a, I don't think there's anything, listen, like you and I have really been, when I say, when I say wounded healer, I, I mean, people who help others that have really seen the bottom, like, and you yeah. and I like, and risen and risen from the ashes and Brad reading, yeah. you have risen from the ashes, like, wow. Yeah. Um, and so to me, it was like, yeah, things came up in that path that was like, oh boy, this is, this is not pleasant. And, and, and what am I going to do about this? Like, and I, I think what I learned a little bit was everything's pretty solvable, hard and treacherous sometimes, but also being able to look at those, what you say, horrible, nasty things actually is a skill and, um, and made me know my own self and my own mm -hmm. strength. And it's what developed my bravery and it's what developed my courage. And frankly, I think you would say also developed my compassion. Like it makes right. me, I think of this time during at the beginning of COVID, I had a, a slip in my eating disorder. Like, mm -hmm. and I was, and, and I was so embarrassed about it. And I went to the nutritionist that wrote the book with me. And I said, Nikki, I'm not telling one person about this. I'm not mm -hmm. telling one person about this. You know, my community doesn't need to know. It's going to, you know, all my stuff. It's going to trigger everybody else. Blah, blah. I tell the whole story. <laughs> and then I came back to myself and it was yeah. like, no, you're actually going to tell everybody about this because then people who are also struggling are going to know that it's okay to struggle and you can come. And like, that was a practice for me. Like, I actually right. think that's a practice. Is And so it's kind of important that you get to the bottom of it because then it's also scary anymore. It's exactly what you're saying to slay the dragons. This is a little bit, this is kind of what I think about in terms of therapist training. I think you're absolutely right. Well, thank you. Somebody, somebody's <laughs> in a, a, a toxic relationship, you know, getting out is, you know, the, the, the thing that they don't want to do that they can't consider, but it's, it's, it's the obvious answer. I think as therapists or friends or parents, you know, we can say things like, you might want to do this, or this could work, or it's worked for me. But what happens for you and me is that people are in relationship to situations, circumstances, and behaviors that they don't do the obvious thing. I mean, that's where your talent as a therapist really is 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 called upon because um, when the person isn't able to execute the skill or the thing or solve the problem that that looks pretty solvable, that is pretty solvable you're dealing with something else. Mm. You're dealing with resistance, which has its roots in trauma and, and wounding and history. And so, yes, I, I talk about this in one of the papers I wrote. We, we solve problems. We offer skills and tools. We do all of that as therapists. And what really differentiates us from teachers or, or self-help, just, just being a self-help author or, or speaker is 
I also make room to, to help work on the resistance for what seems so obvious and simple uh, out of the situation or this problem this person is dealing with. And as somebody who, who took a decade, and I'm not talking about my wife, but another really important relationship in my life, as somebody who took a, a decade to get out of a toxic relationship in my life, I kind of have patience for people that don't see the door. Absolutely. I'm like, well, it takes what it takes. I mean, yeah. oh my goodness. I mean, I think it, it took me 20 years yeah, right. to really address my eating. The door was there the whole time. I, I say it all, the, I say it all, I say it in my, in my spiritual community. I really, I say it in my spiritual community. I say it took me 13 years to get 13 years. Yeah. So don't give up till the miracle happens. Yeah, I think yeah. that is true. And gosh, I wonder if I had me or I had you, you know, maybe the path didn't have to be so gnarly. So maybe we create a little bit, maybe, you know, my spirit animal is a lion, but also there's like a big rhinoceros in me. You know, I like to like nudge people with my right, right, horn, right. which is part of my charm, but also part of my defect. Mm -hmm. But I do think that maybe we can help people to get there. Of course, they're on their own path and perhaps they want to move it. A you little. want to know something, Molly? This is one of my favorite things to talk about today. <laughs> Sorry so if many. it's off track. I, I assume maybe you can edit this out if you don't want to include it. My therapist taught me something not too long ago. She said, dealing with resistance is like driving a car on a frozen, a solid frozen lake. Too much gas, you lose traction. Too much brake, you lose traction. Too quickly to the right or to the left, you lose traction. So when a therapist comes to me and says, how do I work with this mother, this father, this child? I say, how fast can you go? How quickly can you turn? And so when I'm trying to help you, if you were my client, I'm driving a car on a frozen lake. Mm -hmm. I, I, I can only give so much gas before it gives. I can only turn so sharply before it gives. And that's on the therapist or the friend or the sponsor or the mentor is to recognize where you're at and what you can tolerate. Now, the other thing I teach is if you practice driving on a frozen lake, you get good at it. So I'm better on a frozen lake than I was 20 years ago. I can get away with a lot more things. I can, I can corner pretty well. I know exactly. I, I get to the other side much faster than new therapists or than I did years ago. But that analogy helps me to understand the kind of the, the pushing and the nudging. What's too much when I've lost traction, I've gone too fast. I've gone too far. What about um, self-forgiveness? I, think there are a lot of people who live in deep regret of time lost, of things they've done to themselves, of things they've done to others. What do you say to people who live in this deep shame or deep regret or deep self-hate rooted in not being able to forgive themselves? Yeah. Well, well I, I get it. I it's a, Me too. It's, it's a battle. <laughs> One of my favorite illustrations of it is from the movie, The Two Popes. Did you see that? No. Is it a spoiler well, alert? Spoiler. Okay. You could do it. You know, when the new Pope was coming in, they had some interviews together. The, the new Pope was, was, is much more forgiving, much more based on love, less on dogma and rigidity mm -hmm. and judgment. The old Pope was more rigid, more conservative in his views. And as they were making the transition, the old Pope said, I have my confession to give to you now, which was overwhelming for the new Pope. And um, he said, I knew about the children. Wow. I knew about it. And the new, the new Pope, the incoming Pope was aghast, of course, as any of us would be or are if we're just hearing that for the first time. And he had to forgive. And so it's, it's a, it's, it's a life's journey is to kind of, learn to 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 love ourselves and learn that the lie that we were told that the way to grow to heal and to progress was was through judgment because we were taught and, and modeled that that mm -hmm. a good kick in the butt and fear of, of, of the fire was going to keep us on the right path and that's why when people write a, a musical or, or or a story that turns into a musical like les mis and they show the bishop giving the the, the candlesticks to jean valjean that's why those moments resonate with us deep in our heart because somewhere we know 
like I said earlier, that, that, that the way that it's only in love, it's only in the context of love can we, can we really heal? Because then it's coming from not fear, not guilt and shame, but it's coming from a, a, a kind of an awareness, kind of a, a, a pure place instead of those, those, those things that, that are motivated by, by fear and shame. If we had to give some actionable ideas to someone who is like, yeah, totally not in a space of forgiving myself, Molly, Brad, what do I do? What would you say? What would be a actionable step or an actionable idea? Go to a meeting. What kind of meeting? A 12 step meeting. Um, a refuge recovery meeting, you know, go somewhere where, you know what they say to newcomers when they come to those meetings, they say, we're glad you're here. So find somebody who can understand your experience because to have somebody validate what you are feeling shame and lack of forgiveness about is the first step, the me, the me too of all of it, the head nodding. Brene Brown talks about that, right? Yeah, that the antidote I, to shame is truth telling and, and validation, that right, it takes right. it right out of the Petri dish. Kind of I thing. don't know how to do it without somebody else. That's my answer. That's, I know people, listen, that's a great answer. Like we don't do it alone is a great. So we would say self-forgiveness maybe can't happen internally. I think there's a part of me that always wished I could do it on my own. And I needed so much help and so many people and I needed so much head nodding. I mean, you're nodding your head at me right now and it's healing me. You know right, what I mean? Right. We were taught that, that we were taught that self-esteem is an, in, we're taught in this country that self-esteem is an inside job and it's not. No. We have to experience ourselves in the presence of an empathic other to learn self-forgiveness and self-love. You, totally. you have to. I love that study that says that the opposite of addiction is connection. It just, yeah. you know, and I don't know if this happens to you, but there are days, this happened to me yesterday. I was in such a space. I mean, thank goodness we didn't know. I mean, it would have just been in my therapy with you yesterday if we were doing the podcast, promise you that. Mm. And it's like, I forgot I had people who loved me. Yeah. And this morning I spoke to someone who's in my power circle and she said, why did you not call me yesterday? And I, and I was like, tearing up. And I said, I just completely forgot. Mm. Like I just completely forgot. Right. And whew, we're just always doing our work. Aren't we Dr. Reedy? Always life's like work, work in progress. If I arrive, I'll give you a call and tell you what it's like <laughs> so far. I don't expect to arrive anytime. I know I said this twice though, but like you did say this to me many years ago and it's, and it really resonates with me. It's, it's actually moved me out of shame into some pride or, or self-esteem. You said, Molly, you're always doing your work. And I am, I'm a seeker. I'm, I'm always, and it was like, I used to think of that as like, ugh, like I'm, I always need, I'm so needy. And after you said that to me, I was like, yeah, I'm always doing my work. Look at yeah. me. And I, and you are too. You're like, you're always in the other chair. There's a, um, on the back of my book, I borrowed a piece of from the the, the prophet Khalil Gibran, and the, the line is, "In your giant self, uh, in your in your longing for your giant self lies your goodness, and that longing is in all of you." So when I see somebody doing something silly or destructive, or or unhealthy, I have to remember they're trying to find their giant self. And he goes on to say that for some of you, it's a torrent of waters rushing to the sea. And for others, it's a meandering stream. And I'm paraphrasing. But, you know, the, the, the addicts that I've worked with, the people that have struggled with, with, with food, the people that have struggled with other mental health issues, I can find if I look and, and, and listen well enough, I can find their longing for their giant self. And that's, that's that part of them that's, that once you find it's, it's not only easy to love, it's, it's automatic love. Yeah. And it's a practice. I, I think it's a practice and I think it, it ebbs and it flows, right? Like yesterday, right, right, right. yesterday's like not the day I'd want to be podcasting, but today it was like, okay. And I think that kind of that Buddhist idea, sure. just sort of fresh, 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 fresh. You'd be doing something at 401 and be doing something totally different at 402. Sometimes my children could walk into my office and say, F you dad. And I would just be I would turn into the Buddha and ask them what, what was going on. And there's times when they're breathing too loud and I want to strangle them. So that's it so relieving that you have that in, you know, sometimes I get worried, like you've really, oh. you know, lost your edge. <laughs> yeah. it's, it's there. there. I got an edge. 
Oh, Brad Reedy, you are just, I didn't even get to fifth. I mean, literally, we didn't talk about Joseph Campbell, which we have to get to, you have to come back and we have a lot to talk about, but I think we got to some of the roots of what we are really craving, which is what I'm promising people these days. And um, I love you. And thank you for being a wonderful friend and a wonderful teacher and a wonderful human. And uh, where can we, where can we know more about you, Brad? Can you share that with us? Yeah, you can go to drbradreedy.com to find out about me, my work, my my books yeah. on Instagram at drbradreedy.com or my program's website, which is evoketherapy.com. And you can find the work that we're doing there with young people and families, intensive programming for, for individuals, couples, and families too. Yeah. You can also learn how to make fire from a piece of wood and a stick, which is another story we could tell another time. Right, right. I accidentally got into the wilderness. You did programs. It. You accidentally <laughs> yeah. ended up sleeping on the ground in the in the forest. It was a sneak attack, I would say. It yeah. was a sneak attack that you had. Uh, okay, well, uh, wonderful. Thank you so much, and I can't wait to have you back on the show. And thanks for having well, me. See you next time.